Hi everybody, this is Luke and I have a question for you. When is it that you consider something as difficult? I'm asking in general, whether it's something that has to do with mechanics, where your hands are involved, or maybe something about computer stuff, which requires more of your mental effort, there might be something we have already done and that we still consider as difficult. But at the same time, some new stuff that we try might seem really easy since the very beginning. Generally, the more you try something, and the more you gain experience with it, the easiest it becomes, right? Now, let's consider something that you try for the first time. Can it be that it feels so difficult, even before you start with it? Like, you read the steps involved, it all seems quite clear, but then you realize there are so many parts, or too many different variables, and each one of them can increase the likelihood of a failure. This feeling is what I felt in the beginning when I tried to approach installing the open source firmware on the Tongsheng TSD02 motor. Let's take the display for instance. The fact that you need to use a different one to make it work and the necessity of making some soldering was the reason why I waited for so long. Decided to concentrate instead on the reprogramming of the Bofeng BBS02B, which felt apparently easier. Fortunately for us, we don't need to do anything like that anymore. Today, we're going to install the open source firmware to unlock the full potential of the TSDZ2. We'll see how we can do this, keeping our stock display like the VLCD5 and the basics to custom tune our beloved Tongsheng Midrad kit. Is it as difficult as it seemed to me in the beginning? We'll see it together. In the meantime, I read your thoughts down in the comment section of this video. If you haven't done yet, subscribe to the channel and let's start. I'm a Windows user, so I'm going to use this operating system, but apparently you're free to use something else. Let's start from this blog right here. As you can see, the first step is to get a programming cable. The USB chip is called ST-Link V2 STM8 and you can either buy a pre-built one from one of those sites, for example, or buy the USB chip plus a speed sensor cable to build one yourself. I'm a lazy guy, so I just bought a pre-built one. I decided to go for the shop called EcoCycle. The cable is very well made, but if you're outside of the US, the delivery will not be cheap. If you're comfortable with DIY projects, building one yourself will save you some real money. Let's talk now a bit about the software you'll need. As you may already know, the different variants of the Tongsheng motor differ from each other by just a couple of bytes in their stock firmware. But in case you want to install a completely different firmware, and you're not ready yet to give up your stock display and playing around with the welder, this open source project from Mbrusa is what you were looking for. This community is doing a fantastic job. Since the configurator is made for Java, you'll need to install the Java runtime environment, if you don't have installed yet. The second piece of software you'll need is the small device C compiler. We'll use this one to compile our custom firmware. Another mandatory thing is the ST visual development. It's essential to backup and restore our original firmware. Moreover, it contains our USB driver. Accept the license and then we'll need to provide our email address, where we receive the download link. And finally, let's get the source code of this project. You have two possibilities. You can simply download it as a zip file or you can check out the Git project with your favorite Git client. This way you'll be always up to date every time you pull the project from its master branch. If this sounds too weird to you, simply downloading the zip file will be fine as well. Alright, time to install some software, starting from the SDCC. Windows may try to stop us. In this case, we'll select Run Anyway. Nothing fancy here, just remember to install the full version as explained in the wiki, or at least the version with the include and stm8 libraries. I go with the full one. Now the st toolset. 
remembering to install it in the root of the C drive. First, let's extract the setup. Let's launch it. When it asks where to install, we'll just browse the path and remove program file x86 from it. Let's also install the drivers. Wonderful! We can check if it's the right location by copying the path from the wiki and passing it in the address bar of Windows Explorer. Yep, all good! Before connecting the cable, let's mount our battery and be sure it's turned on. In my case, I'm going to use a USB extension cable. Now we can unplug the speed sensor. At its place, we can connect the programming cable instead. When we connect the USB cable, the computer will automatically find its driver. One way to check if it was recognized is to go into the computer management and search for the SD link in the device manager. Now, before doing anything, let's open the SD Visual Programmer to back up our original firmware. Let's select the same device as shown in the blog and then OK. The firmware is stored in three different locations. For this reason, we are going to read and save from the three corresponding tabs Program Memory, Data Memory and Option Byte. In the worst case scenario, we'll just need to reopen the ST Visual Programmer and for each of the three tabs, we will open the corresponding file and reprogram that specific location. This programming step is optional. Feel free to do it in case you don't like the new custom firmware that we're going to install in the next steps. Ok, let's go back to the repository. If you decided to download it as a zip file, you can now unpack it in the root of the C drive. If you don't have Java runtime already installed, this is the right moment to go for it. In this video, we are not going to explain every single setting or behavior about this firmware. Otherwise, it will be too long. By the way, everything I've learned and all that I still have to understand lies in these pages. There's a manual for the display and one for the parameters. At the time of recording, they are translated into three languages. Please have a look before diving into the custom firmware. In case you are using a 32-bit version of Windows, you'll need to replace the binaries of the local SIGWIN folder. There's a zip for the 32-bit and one for the 64-bit version. Ok, now we are ready to launch the TSDZ2 Java Configurator. 
In the proven settings, we'll find two presets, one for the 48 volt variant and one for the 36 volt. When you choose one, the program will reset all the fields. To know which one you got, please read it from the motor plate data. The first setting I will change is the wheel circumference. If you want some examples where to find the right value for you, you can simply refer to the manual. I will also uncheck lights, since mine is not connected to the motor. After I check the brake sensor, the program will allow me to also select the throttle as an optional feature. I will also uncheck the street mode enabled on startup. If you're wondering what the street mode is, this is also explained in the manual. I also want the display to be responsible for the max speed. The one last change I need to do is in the assistant settings tab, where I want to select the hybrid assist mode on startup. This mode is essentially a combination between torque assist and power assist. In theory, this should be the best assist for mixed traffic scenarios. I'm ready, so I'll just go on and smash the compile and flash button. After the operations completed, you'll find your settings saved in the experimental settings, ready to be loaded for the next time. After each write session, don't forget to eject the cable before unplugging it. Finally, we can plug back the speed sensor and turn up the bike. The only weird thing I noticed so far is some ghost speed at startup time and when you turn on the lights. It doesn't last more than a few seconds and that's why I don't care much. The good thing is that now the battery level is way more precise than before. Despite this small display issue, I went out and tried the new firmware, and I was impressed. The hybrid mode is a game changer, and for the first time I had a sense of what the real potential of this mid-drive kit could possibly be. Of course, I didn't stop there. As you might imagine, I also... I'm sorry guys, that's all we have time for today. There will be a second part of this video, which still needs some work. But I wanted you to have these first parts available so that you could already start exploring this version of the open source firmware for the TSDZ2. It's important to say that this is not the only way to install a custom firmware on your Tongsheng motor. There are other projects, even older and possibly more tested than this one. By the way, this method that I've described allows us to keep the stock display while at the same time giving us enough space for a lot of customization. That's why it seemed to me as a good starting point. I will surely explore other methods in the future. Now, let me spend a few words about some comments I received. Some of you have seen my comparison video, this one, pointing out that both motors could have been reprogrammed, or like in this case, reflashed. And that's true. Those mods can affect and even invalidate some of the things I said in the past videos. What's important to keep in mind is, as I said also in that video, that comparing those motors with their stock configuration was still the right thing to do. That's the reason behind my initial question. When do you consider something as difficult? This topic of mid-drive conversion is not easy for everyone. Some one of us surely have the mechanical skills to install those motors, but some others might just consider the purchase and ask someone else to realize the installation. At the same time, I'm not expecting all of my audience to have the same level of skills or the same amount of free time to be able to custom tune the configuration of their motors. Making a comparison video relying on a modified experience compared to the stock one would have meant lying to you. And that's not something that I want nor like to do. But what do you think guys? Did you try this firmware already? If you have any comments or suggestions, I'll read them in the comment section of this video. That said, I highly suggest you to verify if you are subscribed to the channel. 
So you won't miss the next episode where I'll show you some further changes to the configuration, as well as a range comparison with the stock firmware, and also some last points to be discovered and clarified. If you want to support me, you can show your appreciation by hitting the like button. Thanks for watching and see you on the next one.